Hello to everyone on the line. Going to give it another minute and then we'll get started. All right, good afternoon. Thank you for joining the Energy Market Update and a special welcome to all of our channel partners able to make it this month. My name is John Vieira. The agenda we'll go over today is natural gas fundamentals, market news, weather, and market data. We have our trusty disclaimer to the right. There are a whole bunch of energy stories out in the news in the recent weeks. So please, if we don't cover it today, reach out to your rep so we can discuss it more with you. But starting off with natural gas fundamentals, like we usually do, because it's always there for you each week. And it's becoming a sneaky story as we're going to be leaving summer and starting the fall. So for the injection estimate, we had 29 and 30 BCF supposed to be put in the ground. So a pretty tight estimate of where people expected. We had the first big miss that we've had in a few weeks and we missed to the lower side. So if anything, that's bullish, a little bit of a surprise today for prices coming out. So 29 to 30 being the estimate, we came out more than 10 below. So 10 billion cubic feet below the estimate with 18 being put in the ground. If we look at the chart in the middle, we notice that a lot of that is coming out of the South Central. So a lot to do with ERCOT and we're gonna see that reflected in the graphs. The East doing a little bit better, putting some actually away. The bigger story are the numbers of where we were last year, but more importantly, where we compare to that five-year average. So when we last talked, we were in the mid 300s, very comfortable position. Over the past several weeks, we've been losing about 20 BCF a week. And if that keeps up from, from where we are at a surplus, as we start to get closer to the winter, that really could put some upward pressure on prices. And we don't wanna to wait too long for that to happen. So taking a look at the picture, we noticed that the blue line after having a lot of space, and yes, this is a tinier graph for space-wise, but this is billions of cubic feet space between the blue, which is where we actually are, to the gray five-year average, and the light gray is the min and max of those five years. We see the blue line hooking back down towards the gray. The closer it gets to the gray, the more pressure it is to send prices up. And if it drops below the gray, I mean, we can expect prices to really rally as we get into the winter. So. Very important story we need to keep an eye on as we're leaving summer and starting the fall. Estimates for the coming week that will end 825 are 15 at 35. So again, a very low amount. We started into the spring and into the summer. We were doing numbers close to the triple digits, high 80s, 90s. We've been below 50 with these lower numbers for quite a while. And we've been putting a dent into that surplus that we had. The other thing that we know is that natural gas production has not really ramped up. And as we look at the forecast with the gray box and we update these each time and the gray moves over a little bit for the dates, red is up to the red arrow is reality. And then the gray box to the right is the forecast. We don't see that orange line shooting up for production for natural gas. On the other hand, we know that LNG continues to be sent out of this country at a record pace. So natural gas leaving our shores, leaving us with less supply. So if LNG outpaces the production, and right now it's forecast to do it by a good amount, right? We're going to be at a net loss because we're sending gas to other places. And some have forecasts that we've been hitting about 14 and change BCF that we're sending away from our shores. In the next several years, we could be up to 28 or 30 BCF that we're sending away. So almost doubling the amount of LNG that we're doing right now which would be a big hit to supply. And where is it going? We've covered this before, but the national balancing point over in the UK, the tidal transfer facility used by the EU, the Dutch virtual trading hub, and the JKM, the Japan, Korea marker over in Asia. Looks the same as the graphs that we've seen before, but this is updated for August. Again, the upside and downside risk. Now this is only Henry Hub NYMEX, but this is what we want to apply to the graphs that we're gonna cover in the market data section. And a picture saying a thousand words, explain to clients, what's the risk the price could go up? The black arrow versus maybe tail off a little bit more. So how much do you wanna put at risk? The only real difference is we saw this front arrow uh, for the spike come down a little bit. It was a little closer to 10 last time we talked, but the outside arrow is still up there. Taking a look at market news. So the stories keep stacking up. 
The most recent to come out is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, so NERC. We don't talk about them as much. We usually talk about FERC, who they report to, but NERC is basically in charge of checking out and assessing the grid. Are we reliable and resilient? Are we gonna be able to get power to people for all of the US? In recent months, we've had ICE in New England and NISO both come out warning saying, hey, you know what? We're kind of on a precarious path right now with our energy future and it could get very dangerous real quick. And then recently in the past couple of weeks, we had PGM, ERCOT, MISO and SPP put out the same story and they're touching 30 states. So we have pretty much all of the major markets in the country saying, hey, you're, we're in a tough situation already. This new policies that's coming come forward really is going to put reliability and resiliency at risk, as well as price for customers going higher. So big issue. It's huge to hear that our oversight committees and our grid operators are all coming out. They're all nonpartisan groups saying that uh, there could be danger ahead. Let's maybe plan a little bit better. Let's take some thought about this policy instead of just pushing forward with no regard for anything else. So our takeaway is we really wanna be looking at those future years for clients right now, because there's a lot of reasons that prices could pop. And right now where the markets are for most of our markets, they're in a lower spot, which would be a great place to lock in for remainder of 23, 24, out through 2028 to 2030. Going along with this same theme, BlackRock, who is the largest asset manager in the world, managing trillions of dollars, right? They're pumping the brakes a little bit. I mean, they were the front of the wave, if not the wave, really kind of pushing this whole ESG in, what, in regards to us really just looking at that energy piece. They're one of the biggest proponents. Um, Larry Fink, their CEO, came out with statements basically saying, we're going to force companies to change their behavior because this is just what we're going to do. Well, they just shot down... 373 shareholder proposals pertaining to energy and energy social initiatives. So about 93 proposals that were out, um, they shot down. Um, and they mentioned that, you know what, they have a fiduciary obligation to their investors. They just can't do everything that someone comes up with to go green or go clean. Um, so this is a big change in tune for them where beforehand it was, I mean, pushed forward by any means necessary. Now they're kind of using Hey, you know, we owe it to our investors. They're citing the risks. They don't want to be losing the mo that much money. And we've seen companies over the past years that are doing clean and green projects asking for more subsidies and more money because all of a sudden they're uneconomic. And I mean, this is act exacerbated by, and I mean, the rising interest rates that we have making cost of goods more expensive and, per and processes and the supply chain issues we've seen around the world. So the risk is continuing to grow where now they're kind of slowing down on what they're gonna do that way. Um, this kind of also touches on the 401k stuff we talked about in the past about private citizens, 401ks accounts, whether they should be have to pass a green audit or you know what I mean, do what they're supposed to do, which is the fiduciary obligation to make as most money for uh, the person that holds that 401k. They did do a little bit of light blame of unclear policy and saying the Biden administration has kind of opened the gate that's caused some problems for the business. But more importantly, in this quote that we have below that you'll see on the send up, but basically in simple terms they're saying, you know, I mean, we're worried about actually uh, supply being able to hit demand. We're worried about prices staying low enough and affordable. And yes, we want to get there, but you know, the timelines we had might have been a little bit too lofty and we were trying to go too quick because things aren't working out the way that we thought all rosy. I mean, we had the issue that was over in Europe when uh, the Nord Stream pipelines were shut down and the second one didn't get built and all of a sudden prices spiked through the roof during 2022. Well, there's no one really to bail out the United States, unlike us helping out EU along with some other countries around the world. So we just wanna make sure uh, clients are aware of that now to understand the risks. And maybe go a little bit long term, especially when these prices are lower than they have been over the past 52 weeks. On the other side of this, so we're getting the warnings from all of our grid operators, all the oversight committees that actually sit down with the math every day and are saying it doesn't line up. But the Biden administration has continued to push through with going clean by any means necessary. Again, it's not whether you like it or hate it. We're politically agnostic. We just want to know what's it going to do to prices. So on top of this, we have the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management 
who basically gives out leases for natural gas, oil production, also building the wind farms and things of that nature. Um, currently, it was put, the new head of the agency was appointed by Biden after she couldn't get a post to be confirmed by the Senate because she has a very climate activist past. So just telling of who's in office, again, not whether you like it or not, it's just simply track record, what you expect to come from these different groups. Um, they're saying they're going to try to preserve the rice whale in the Gulf of Mexico. And so they're cutting off huge amounts of areas that no longer can drill for oil or natural gas. So oil has associated natural gas as a byproduct and straight natural gas. So that means less supply of natural gas. So another cut into supply of natural gas. So what does less supply do? Usually that raises prices. So that's an issue that's out there. And that's recent um, coming in that will affect us. And goes into the story of I mean, how much natural gas production are we going to have? We've been dropping over the past several weeks from, again, mid 300s to now basically mid 200s. Huge story that we've been talking about since early 2022. The Commerce Department just released the final report that found that five companies in four of the Southeast Asian countries were guilty of importing basically Chinese solar products. Um, and just rubber stamping them so they could avoid Chinese tariffs that basically the U.S. enacted for environmental and humanitarian reasons. Those countries have imported in the past couple of years upwards of 80% of our solar parts and products. So what happens now that a couple of the, uh, five of these companies basically got in trouble and found guilty, right? Do they become uneconomical with the tariff? Are they going to be even allowed to import some of that still being shook, shook out? Also in the ruling in the uh, report, there's a new audit process for the companies that want to partake in importing to the US from those four countries. So how big of a disruption is this gonna be? Is it gonna put current projects that are in the US underwater or just simply uh, push back for a while? So we're not hitting. So we're shutting down fossil fuel and maybe not be able to build new renewable generation. Where are we gonna get this new electricity? And don't forget, everything is trying to be electrified right now, right? If we start more EVs on the road, electric demand is going to go up. If gas stoves go, I mean, electric demand is going to go up. So demand is going to be rising in the next couple of years. And now we're really cutting off supply one way or the other, whether it's banning fossil fuels or not being able to simply get it. So again, all of these lend to making clients aware, looking at those future years, especially what we're seeing with the market now. The ERCOT, They've seen a little bit of a pop in the market, so they don't have as friendly a situation as, say, ICE New England, ISO, PJM. So just some more detail around the Chinese uh, tariff there and the solar panel imports. We had them up to 85% of the solar U.S. Uh, panel imports in 2021. Now we're wondering, okay, Cambodia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, how big of a huge disruption is this going to be? I mean, how far back if these projects going to get built? We know that President Biden had granted a two-year waiver on import tariffs from basically all the countries, including China, because none of the goals that he had presented were going to be met unless he presented a waiver. Bipartisan legislation in Congress was pushed to overturn that. However, he used his veto to shoot that down, and there was not enough, uh, the bigger vote to overturn a veto to get that overturned completely. So basically, that's still in place for a little bit. We're going to see what happens come June 2024, but don't wait too long, because especially if prices take off this winter, they might not be coming back down. Because this news is new. It's just coming out. The other thing is China could just decide to stop giving us solar parts and panels. Um, before, I mean, we were really, since um, early 70s into the 80s, really focused on energy independence. We accomplished that as the U.S., but during this clean and green push, We've really been kind of handing the keys to other countries in the world because we simply don't have the minerals or the economic advantage of manufacturing because a battery to manufacture here, you're paying minimum wage, you're paying health care. Um, so a big difference in cost to build these panels. So how is that going to get done? And are any of the bigger issues of Taiwan, the South China Sea, going to come between China and the U.S.? Um, things have been rocky and getting rockier, it seems. There was hope in some tries to thaw out that relationship. Um, right now, China is leading a big push to drive countries away from using the dollar for a lot of their trade as part of a BRICS country, some of the other big countries in the world. Uh, recently, we had China release a docu docu series that included basically preparing for an invasion of Taiwan. 
We had China and Russia just conducting joint naval operations off the southwestern coast of uh, Alaska that the uh, Navy ships had to be sailed in and basically run them off. So we've been getting tested. Um, hopefully this gets better, not to be doom and gloom, but we just want clients to be ready about what could happen in the worst case scenarios or becoming more likely scenarios of the relationship getting worse. <clears throat> On the other side, the big world news is um, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, which we've gone through how it started um, as a military exercise and then admitted as a war. The Nord Stream Pipeline 2 not going to be completed. Nord Stream 1 gets blown up. That's what sent prices around the world higher last year. And the uncertainty of supply chain issues and ripple effects about, I mean, does China pick a side? If they start backing Russia, that's going to be a big problem for other our renewable industry. So the biggest news coming out this past week is the Wagner boss, who most people saw on the news, maybe or maybe not attempted a coup, um, at least made some kind of stage show of it. He just died in the jet crash. Um, witnesses says there was an explosion in the air. I mean, whether it was him trying to disappear, whether it was Putin, whether it was another military, that hasn't been determined. Um, either way, that's a big story out there, more uncertainty. The biggest thing is that the direct US and NATO versus Russia confrontation starts to escalate. And that's more what we're worried about. Right now, it's kind of a proxy war through the Ukraine against Russia. If it becomes more of a war of most uh, more countries involved, because Belarus, they've been holding military drills on the border. And now Poland is saying that Russia is bringing nuclear weapons into Belarus. So simply is situation has continues to go from bad to worse. Um, will this have any supply chain issues pertaining to energy and how is that going to impact prices? Keeps going, probably going to put more upward pressure on prices. If we can all find peace tomorrow, we'll probably bring prices down, but that doesn't seem as likely. And also not to forget um, the EPA, the Department of Energy um, continue to push, even though they've been losing at the Supreme Court in some cases, um, right now, EPA is focused on kind of death by a thousand cuts to coal, and we really have PGM, probably the riskiest of all the major markets because of their reliance on coal, and then you have ERCOT, ice in the wind, and really only using it more during the winter. And just as we go down, um, new stories keep getting added. You have New Jersey, Maryland, Rhode Island, Maine, Michigan, and other states throwing out, I'm going to do this a little bit faster than you for going clean and green. You know, I'm going to do a little bit more higher percentage in a shorter amount of time. Now, this is running, this is politicians throwing out these goals. And, you know, I mean, is reality going to be able to hit it with the engineering and the supply chain issues? Big questions, also with the super high interest rates. And again, these sometimes take a little bit to come out the percentages, but taking a look at Q4 and Q3, we noticed that most of the major markets that we're in, right, only up a little bit or actually down year over year when looking at 2021 to 2022 for the renewables being used in those areas. So we're not hockey sticking up, I mean, jumping by 5, 10, 15% of going renewable year over year. Some cases we're actually using less renewables. So again, the number is not really lining up with a lot of the headlines that are out there. And here we have an actual disclaimer from one of the big suppliers and uh, for Massachusetts. And we see circled in red, we have other renewables and then we have solar and wind, right? Nine and a half and 6%. So not huge amounts for the actual full year of 2022 being used. Not anything close to 50% coming from renewables, right? Not even at 25. So quite a ways to go compared to some of the goals that are thrown out just for 2030 for 2035. So big changes still need to be made. Changes cost money and changes also cause a lot of risk unless, I mean, the engineering grid is almost an eighth wonder of the world with the way it performs every day compared to some countries like India who have rolling blackouts between their major cities. As we take a look into the forecast, looks the same, updated, is we don't see the green and black lines really shooting straight up with the solar and wind to actually be used by a generation fuel source. Some of the other maps out there will have, you know I mean, it's being built or maybe it's gonna be used, but this is actual what's gonna be used for generation. And that's where we're getting the electricity. So it's important to, when looking at graphs, make sure to take a look at, you mean the headers and what the details are. And then not saying that we're gonna 
not doing any better, but going back to 2010, we haven't increased really renewable share by more than 2% a year. So to think we're all going to sudden going to start going 10, 20%, unless some kind of new technology comes out, which always could, um, it's going to be tough to hit a lot of these numbers. And in the short term, very unrealistic for 24, 25, up through 28. Other than that, we want to be talking about, I mean, the other buckets we can optimize for clients and just some of the words updated on the slide. But same idea is that the PGM uh, and ICE in New England capacity pass through can be a good strategy, especially because of the new rules. The new rules came in below where that yellow line is on the table because before you see them jumping up and down all over the place. So in general, the prices have continued to tick down. Basically, subsidized assets, renewables, can offer into the capacity program, but underneath their real cost. So if you can offer in for underneath the real cost, right, it's going to be cheaper. So we expect that to keep the lid on prices for the time being. So capacity pass through being a good strategy for most all the zones, except probably the green on this chart for DPL South, which is having some issues. So basically the rest of the map, except right here, might, might not be the best candidates. And the capacity auctions for PGM have been delayed. Um, it's supposed to happen on June 14th. On June 9th, they got pushed back to maybe next June. Um, again, this is supposed to be a three-year forward capacity auction, um, so it's not right now. They're tr really trying to play catch-up compared to ICE in New England, which is still functioning properly at three years ahead, supposed to give time for planning and actually building assets, because that's the whole point of the capacity market. Send the price signal. The price goes up. Smart money from around the world will come and maybe build a new project, whether that's a natural gas plant or a new renewable offshore wind or solar panels, something in the area that can help out an area that where prices rise. And we see that prices have stayed low since the new rules came in. And during the next auction, FCA 18, and then the last one, FCA 19, which will go out through May of 2029, more subsidized assets are gonna be let in. So we expect these prices to stay lower you avoid the risk premium by doing a capacity pass-through. You can also lower your capacity tag through the peak notification program. So it's a way for customers to save money if they improve on themselves or the market price goes down. And if they lock it in, the supplier is the one that's gonna keep the money. Taking a look at weather. So we're through most of August right now, but still taking a look at August, September, October right now. Um, most was likely above average for most of our major markets, and it has sure been hot down in Texas, and the prices have reflected that. We have had some pops in New England, but nothing too sustained just yet, although summer is not over. And now as we look further into the fall, September, October, into November, we notice that New England, New England still likely above, Texas likely above for most of it, and then leaning above for PJM um, and the rest of Texas there. So. Again, supposed to stay hot. We don't have that cold pocket where it says equal chances in the middle. That was kind of helping people out a little bit. Now it's kind of 50-50. And this can also lead to another problem. If prices, uh, temperatures stay hot, a lot of these generators usually do maintenance during the fall period. They're going to keep running. So if we whipsaw from hot to cold, I mean, you might run into more problems with generators. You lose that actual supply, prices take off. And that's a very common thing, especially up in the Northeast. and sometimes happens down in Texas like it did with Storm Uri. So for quite a while, we were in the picture on the right, which was La Nina. We are currently in El Nino after leaving the neutral pattern. Um, and that just means that warmer temperatures could persist over colder. It really just has to do with jet streams sweeping from the Pacific towards the Atlantic. And a couple of weeks ago, we were in the mid 300s for the natural gas storage and El Nino looks like it'll be hanging around for summer. A lot of people start getting comfortable. And again, we've seen prices kind of ranging in the lower side for most of our markets that really have to deal with the winter. But if this flips, and last year we were in a La Nina and we had a above average, which was the opposite of what was supposed to happen. What happens if that starts to be the case? We start getting snow late November, December really expect prices to take off. So that's really the at least warning we want to give clients. That's out there. That's a chance. People are kind of comfortable right now. Things can change by the week, kind of as we usually do each year. You start leaving the summer, the forecast for the Farmer's Almanac are just starting to come out. Then real NOAA three-month forecast will come out, and then the weather will come. 
Um, so that really will drive prices. And we have a lot more room that we could move up with only a little bit we could move down unless things change huge fundamentally. Taking a look at the coming week for ice in New England, nothing crazy for temperatures. Um, so we don't expect to be issuing any peak demands there. Similarly, a little bit warmer in PGM, but no peak, uh, peak notifications expected this week. Heating up in MISO today and still remaining pretty much a scorcher down in Texas. So we've seen, uh, we'll get to it, but the September prices for Texas have taken off for this year because of what they've been seeing in that heat persisting. So again, it's not too late to sign up for the peak notification. It's always good to get clients attuned with it and how the program works. Although it might be a little late in the game, um, still a chance that we could break on the right, the ice in the England of 22, 280, still a bit, a little bit low compared to past years and the five days for ice in the England and uh, for PGM and hours, all hour ending 17, just by coincidence, usually happens sometimes in the afternoon, depending on when that heat really comes in. And when people aren't really doing the demand response piece as well, because sometimes what was supposed to be the peak hour ends up being one or two outside of that. Um, all these days are days that we've called, so hopefully your clients that are signed up have reacted to that so they can be saving on their next bill when they pick a capacity pass-through strategy. Again, in this market, load falling block and index, fixed data at least, um, locking in future years, locking in different percentages of different years, looking at, and as we get bigger clients, locking in different hours of the day, whether it's peak or off peak, all great strategies that are out there to help really hedge instead of just picking one or the other between fixed and index. Because remember, you buy fixed because you only think prices are going to rise. You buy index because you only think prices are going to go lower. And usually betting on one or the other, not a great bet. A lot of white papers out there saying really the hybrid strategy has proven over the past 10 and 20 years the best strategy to go with. Taking a look at the market data for ice in New England, taking a look at the months out through September 25. Uh, we saw September and October 23 come off a touch, but we saw November and December go up a little bit. And that's what we're really concerned about is, I mean, how high is this winter going to get December 23 through Feb 24? And if it pops, usually March follows that this year and the next year for winter 24, 25. So with where they are and we take a look at the long-term charts we're going to see we're in a good spot so ice in new england around the clock so balance of the year is now september to december we see that ice in new england was off a mill and a half week to week but still close to that 52 week low and as we take a look at the graph on the right the orange graph see it's kind of been bang hanging around the bottom where it could really get all the way back to you know what i mean the top there of the blue Take a look at calendar year 24 for ice in New England was flat week to week, still closer to the 52 week low, but it's been moving up a touch. Taking a look at New England gas balance of the year was off three and a half cents week to week, actually established a new 52 week low yesterday, but back up today. And calendar year 2024 off two and a half cents week to week, still close to the 52 week low. And if we go back to January, right, and then kind of have a ruler from that point to that, pretty flat kind of hang around the bottom. So not going to go much lower than here. Could you mean pick up a cent for the gas, maybe a mill or two on the electric, but we're worried about losing 10 cents, 20 cents, or 10 mills, 20 mills on the upside if these stories start to materialize, whether it's the natural gas, whether it's the supply chain issue, or the recent battery story that just came out. PGM moving in a similar direction with the months. September, October came down a touch. Uh, December, January moving up a little bit. And as we look at PGM Western Hub, September to December balance of the year was off a mill week to week, still close to the 52 week low. Calendar year 24 for PGM, flat week to week, still close to the 52 week low. So again, kind of moving around the bottom, pushed up that rally kind of in the uh, April, May area, um, settled back down, but hasn't really pushed through these floors much. Looking at PGM gas off two cents week to week, still close to the 52 week low. While calendar year 24 was off a penny and a half week to week, still close to the low. So similar story as we're in the Northeast mid Atlantic prices. Well, we got a whole different story when it comes to ERCOT. So the bar on the left looks almost like it did for August, right? If we look at September 23 compared to September 24, it's more than doubled. 
And that's how quickly prices change around and can spike up. As soon as they ran into some high prices, the heat came in. We had these spikes for the LMP. September's up. And you know what I mean? It keeps pushing into October. This bar might shoot up. And then you're going to start seeing the risk being added to next year and the following year. So that's what we're saying with don't take too long in the other markets that are enjoying that lower prices because the ERCOT charts have jumped up. So looking at ERCOT, Houston balance of the year was up two mils week to week after having a big jump the previous week. So now pushing further above the average, almost to that midpoint between the high and the low. So it would have been a lot better to be able to pick it up here than it was. And not as high of a spike, but now still over the 52 week average for Houston 24. So take advantage now before we get back to that average is kind of the idea we want to at least put out there for clients just so we can say we warned them in case they didn't execute at least part of that hedge. And if you lock in the fixed adder, you can get a price turned around quicker for them. Houston ship channel was off two cents week to week, still close to that 52 week low. And Houston ship channel county year 24 was off one cent week to week. Now a little bit closer to the 52 week low after kind of rallying, getting close to that midpoint. And again, Houston ship channel is neighbors with ERAF Louisiana where the Henry hub is. So we have pretty much the same charts in the middle for blue, but we know that different parts of the country have different prices. Ice in New England being blue, PGM being red. Now, one thing to point out all the way to the right where we are at currently, the red has sneaked a little bit below the gray. So that's actually technically a little bit of a negative basis there for PGM compared to the Henry Hub. Now, most of our clients have more usage in the winter compared to the rest of the year. So you'd only be able to get it negative if you use the same amount every hour of every month of the year. With people using more in the winter, you're probably gonna get a positive uh, basis if you get that quoted, but it's very compressed, great time to pick up gas for PJM and NISO. Um, taking a look at that more under a microscope, we see that Henry Hub being the gray, green being the Houston ship channel, and the red being the PJM, you can see more that it's kind of hanging underneath right now. So it's compressed, great time to pick up gas. At least lock in that basis. Now taking a look at the outside years, looking at ice in the England, we had 24 flat, we had the outer years up or down around half a mil, so not too much movement on that. Again, the gray bar is where the last price of 2023 traded on 1228, 2022, after it kind of came down and settled. And you know, I mean, we're worried about, I mean, these bars popping back up past that with some of these stories, and especially with the outside years being lower and those other stories we've talked about that could impact, how is that gonna work out? So this is probably the best graphs that we wanna use for taking a look at terms if you're gonna use one to say, okay, over the next few years, how's everything been doing? We wanna remember that from 2016, easy energy policy, gas was regarded as a bridge fuel, uh, things were going well. Fracking was okay. Um, then we changed, you know what I mean, who's running the country. All of a sudden, that's not okay. ESG and clean push. And we've seen, then we have the start around here. And this is probably where, if you want to go back to when talking with clients, this is around where you have the start of the Russia-Ukraine war and things change. Obviously, we had the giant run up. We saw all the years move. But from where we are currently, if we went down from here to here, a little bit to go down to a bottom versus, you know, I mean, the tops are around here and here where prices could get to reasonably unless huge things change fundamentally. So that's how we want to be reviewing with clients to just use a picture to evaluate the upside and downside risks. Taking a look at PGM into the future, 24 was flat. Outer years were up uh, less than a mil, so not as much movement there, but creeping a little bit. And right now, 24 is 2 million cheaper than 2025. And again, similar story. If we go back to around 12, 23, 2021, just because I mean it started in February, but this is a good spot. If you drew a line over here, okay, it can go down a little bit, but it also could go up to at least here, if not all the way up here to spike if we start having these bigger world problems come out. Lastly, taking a look at ERCOT. Moving up, 24 with flat, but the outer year is kind of bumping up, catching up to that. They try to trade a lot uh, closer for the outside years. And then probably the most interesting chart being the Houston ship channel. We've seen these outside years really going up and down on all this LNG news that's been going out there. 
So right now, 24 cheap, but the rest of the year is moving up, and that could end up being a problem. And lastly, the lines are kind of all overlapping, the light blue, the magenta, maroon line, and the green. Compared to the blue, we're worried about where the tops of those peaks were versus how much it could come down for clients. And lastly, just some points to consider. Most of them we've touched before with one really new one. Managing risk by how high or low can we go from here? I mean, what's the probability of it moving up and down and how far? Evaluating those long terms with all these stories coming out really about shutting down fossil fuels and maybe not hitting forecast to build new supply. Hybrid purchasing strategy allows you to kind of have your foot in both and then move towards what's actually happening instead of being stuck in one or the other, too late in index or too high locking in on fixed. Most expensive months, ice the wing and PGM are going to be the winter. So very important to keep an eye and take advantage when they're lower, which they are currently. And most expensive are the summer months for ERCOT. And, you know, you just see uh, September popping off. So except for the ERCOT electric, um, basically the balance of 23 and county to 24 for all of our markets are below the 52 week average and most of the close to the 52 week low. So very reasonable spot to lock in at least part, if not 100% of a load for a client. We know that um, with all the objections with the current administration, we expect it to continue to push to go clean and green by really any means necessary. And if we keep stacking up the loss of fossil fuel while not being able to bring on the new renewable supply, we could put ourselves in a very tough situation uh, very quickly. We've already had the warnings from all the oversight committees, all the major grid operators saying, you know, I mean, it's already a precarious path. I mean, how much worse are we going to make it to try to complete? And lastly, breaking off the different components, looking at capacity, renewables, or depending on your region, some of the smaller charges helps differentiate that. So again, thank you for attending. Um, channel partners, please reach out to your account manager if you want to follow up on any of this. And have a great day.